Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are supposed to be going straight on with the second session. Um, and I hope those of you who listened to my introduction to the first session will excuse me for repeating for the benefit of those who come in since that moment. I'd like to give a very warm welcome to our esteemed contributors and distinguished participants today. My name is Henry Barlow, and for those who don't know us, I'd like to make a quick introduction of the CEO Action Network, CAN, and our collaborator, Climate Governments Malaysia, CGM. The CEO Action Network, or CAN, is a network of CEOs representing around 45 leading companies across 20 priority sectors in Malaysia, including Sandavi Plantation, working to address sustainability. CGM is the Malaysian chapter of the World Economic Forum's Climate Governance Initiative, founded in 2019 and comprises non-executive directors from leading enterprises in Malaysia. Businesses are the leading emitters around the world and this series of RT engagements with key government ministries and civil society is the private sector trying to play our part and more specifically, this initiative is led by directors and CEOs. Collectively, our focus is on making sure that companies play their part in increasing their climate and sustainability ambitions. Companies can make a huge difference in the fight against the triple crisis of climate change, biodiversity and pollution. Both CAN and CGM are co-organizing this series of roundtables across three main sectors, plantations and agro-commodities sectors, the energy and transport sectors, the property and construction sectors, and the circular economy. Ladies and gentlemen and friends, CAN and CGM are really honoured to have you with us today. We all have a common goal in moving our industry forward on climate action. To be really effective in moving the needle, we need a clear and predictable government policy. session, we hope to get feedback and ideas on high impact areas in the area of low carbon mobility that can significantly lower our sector's carbon impact, get us on the road to net zero. Out of this, CAN and CGM will prepare a, gov a report to government suggesting how we could collectively contribute towards more ambitious mitigation and adaptation efforts in the light of the current climate emergency. This report will be timed to be submitted in the run-up to November's COP26 conference in Glasgow. More generally, we want to play our part in building a whole of society and all of government engagement between stakeholders. For this session, we're especially pleased to have the support and involvement of our panelists, M.R. Chandran, who essentially was the founder of RSPO with a long career in the industry, uh, Hari Krishna Kulavira Singham of uh, Sime Derby Plantations, uh, Engineer Kwa Kyat Seng of Monash University, Malaysia. The conversation will be skillfully monitored by Dr. Gary Thesera. I would also like to thank him, who works for MGTC, for helping us organising this series of roundtables for the plantation sector. I'm confident with the excellent panelists with us, with your input, we'll have a rich exchange of ideas today. Now may I pass the session over to the moderator, Dr. Gary, to start this roundtable session. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary. Thank you, Dr. Henry Barlow. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, this is the second session. We're having them back to back. If you're staying with us from the previous uh, session, then you pretty much know what to expect. But uh, this session is on optimizing resource use. Uh, as you know, the, the palm industry uh, produces an almost unimaginable range of, of resources, uh, not just food and, and all your chemicals, but uh, moving into energy, and even moving into now post-consumer products. We have uh, three uh, extremely uh, gifted speakers uh, uh, lined up for you today. They will all have slide presentations. Um, 
And uh, may I introduce the, the first speaker this afternoon, uh, engineer Mr. Kwa uh, Ket Singh. He's a chartered uh, chemical engineer with 30, uh, 32 years of experience in the palm oil industry covering oil refining, foods, oleochemicals and personal care. He's worked for Unilever, ICI and KLK in Malaysia as well as in Europe and was the general manager of uh, Unikema Malaysia, Sundira and Berhad before retiring in 2005. Subsequently, he's uh, been an advisor to ASEAN Oleochem Oleochemical Manufacturers Group, uh, AOMG, and has also been its representative to the RSPO Standing Committee on Trade and Traceability, this from 2014 to 2019. Engineer Kwa is currently a senior lecturer at Monash University teaching chemical engineering, and he is a fellow of Monash University's Palm Oil Education and Research, uh, or MIPO uh, platform. Uh, Engineer Kwa, you can share your uh, slides now and begin your presentation. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I will start the slideshow now. Okay, I've got the slideshow on now. Yep, can every uh, Gary, can you see my slides? Yes. Just to confirm before yeah. I start. Yeah, kindly yeah. proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, session. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, in this optimizing resource use session about palm bioenergy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Monash, uh, yeah, MIPO is uh, Monash. Uh, Palm Oil Education and Research Platform, and we support um, uh, all the developments and uh, research in the uh, palm oil industry. We have analytical services, uh, we have postgraduate opportunities, and we work in research areas such as social and environmental uh, sustainability, palm oil processing and derivatives, food and health, and of course the last one you might not be able to see is waste to wealth. So, just uh, recently, um, I wrote this article for The Age, and I said, when Malaysia embraces net zero carbon emissions. And in it, I am very positive about all the things that will affect the palm oil industry positively. And my title is when and not if then. So I'm struggling against the poll just now, which is only 20%. 25% or 22% that said, yes, we will achieve net zero carbon emissions. Of course, the caveat is 2050, 2060, 2040. I think that is a question. Uh, yeah, but I think it's an excellent opportunity for the industry to uh, use this positive uh, uh, situation. And why I say it's positive, because if I look at the palm oil mill, for example, it's an excellent example of uh, a unit, a production unit that is self-sufficient in energy, if it uses the biomass, it uses the biogas, and in the event that it exports the electricity, it exports the biomass for other people to use outside it, you can actually not only have a net zero carbon situation, but actually carbon negative then. So I'm very positive about it from the energy point of view. Now, just yesterday, my colleague from uh, MIPO, uh, Dr. Poon Waichin, she just told the star uh, yesterday that uh, the palm oil mill can also contribute to regenerative agriculture, which is a very important part of our journey towards net zero carbon. So with that very positive note, let me share what uh, we have done in Monash. Uh, just before that, let me just share a slide that I think you guys have used in April. And I think I'm just telling you the reason why we are focusing on energy is because it's the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases. Yeah, and uh, that's why we focus on, on it over there. Yeah, you'll be very curious about the green part, but I think that's not part of this discussion at the moment. Um, so what we have, um, uh, just as an introduction, where the biomass, uh, bioenergy could come from is at the plantation. I, I'll have to go through quite fast and because Gary says it's a very short time I have plantation in the mill, from the mill itself, and then after that, from the refinery as well. So we have a lot of products, uh, not only the ones that we are using, but ones we are not using or not using enough yet at the moment. Yeah. 
So what is availability? Quite a lot. And I express this or we express this in tons, which you are figure you're more familiar with, starting with refined uh, products, which are the oils, byproducts from the refinery, which is the distillates, <clears throat> and then the biomass, uh, solid biomass, which is from the plantations and from the mills as well. And then not forgetting the liquid effluent, uh, which is palm oil mill effluent, and as well as the slush palm oil. So there's a lot of it. And what does it look like in uh, energy terms? And so I'll express it in kilo, uh, kilotons uh, of all equivalent then, yeah? So this is a, a, a big picture of it. You can see that, yeah, where, where the, 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 the graph is going, where it is going up to the 24,000 and so on. But in summary, I just like to draw attention to this 64%. So this 64% is theoretically the percentage of primary energy supply uh, that palm oil could replace them. But this is the full potential. Eh? Yeah? Uh, so we're going to look at what is a more likely scenario. Yeah? So very important in this is the conversion processes of these materials into what we can use. So the ones in uh, yellow are the ones that are already commercialized in Malaysia. And in the chemical side, there's transesification, and all of you know about biodiesel <coughs> combustion. There are people uh, making power from uh, biomass. And the one that's untapped at the moment is pyrolysis, where you can get biochar, bio oil, and biosyn gas. <coughs> in the biochemical side, there's hydrolysis and fermentation, where you can you could get uh, bioethanol. And then there's an anaerobic digestion uh, with biogas, which has already been talked about in the first session uh, that has been commercialized. So the current mix at the moment is, yes, we have biodiesel, we have some uh, CHP generation, anaerobic gas. And uh, so I, I put on the right hand side and you just get a quick idea of what's going on. Is where it is green is where it is used at the moment. Yeah, OK. And let's compare to the renewable energy. And this is in primary supply. The 23 is our target, eh? promising uh, at the COP21 in Paris. Yeah, with COP26 coming up, I'm not sure whether these figures were maintained or not because the pressure is on now. So the current mix, this is at 2018, is 7%. And the percentage of C, uh, greenhouse gas intensity reduction promised was 45%. We have achieved 31%. So what we would like to suggest as, as a model mix is that uh, biodiesel will go up to 20%. Uh, industrial use from zero to seven percent. Uh, there will be use of paralysis. Anaerobic digestion will go up from 10, uh, 16 percent to 100 percent. Yeah, uh, we're not addressing the issues that will go with it and so on. I think that will come up in the discussions. And uh, as a result of that mix that we have, you can see a lot more greens over here. Yeah, and in this mix, uh, the RE is going to go up to 35% and the GHG intensity reduction is going up to 54%. But uh, of course you will ask then, what if we did everything, yeah, just for the sake of knowing what the potential is. So the full potential is, yes, it could go up to RE 53% and GHG reduction 69%, and that's the full potential. But of course we won't do that because then all the palm oil will be used for uh, biodiesel and so yeah there's nothing left for us to eat then. and there's always that question of balance between food and and energy yeah so <clears throat> just to put that that mix that we have suggested is the current mix at the moment you can see the renewable part is very small and if you use our model mix then biodiesel will increase the biogas will increase uh and and the biggest one is paralysis products yeah and when our guys put this together, it just reminded me that way back before 2018, there was this EPP7, which wanted to convert uh, biomass into <coughs> biofuels. Yeah, but I think you've got to bear in mind, I'm going to get a lot of questions on this perhaps, is that <coughs> our focus is only on energy. Obviously, those uh, biomass that we are proposing or bioproducts could be used for other things as well, such as furniture, animal feeds, fertilizers. There's a lot of things you can use it for, but 
I mean, what, what you wanted to show is the potential we have, and that is why I'm very optimistic to say when and not if. So the paper's conclusion is that bioenergy can help Malaysia address the RE and uh, GHG intensity reduction targets. Farm-based products, particularly biomass, are, are the key components. <clears throat> so farm bioenergy can lead to decarbonization of Malaysia, contribute towards achieving net zero or net negative carbon in the future. There are issues, and one of them, which we found very difficult as well, is it's very difficult to track the movement of uh, palm-based feedstocks eh, because they are not monitored. So it's very difficult to perform the carbon reporting. We have that tracked very well in the MPOB reporting for oils and so on, but not for the carbon mass. Some palm feedstocks are exported. We should be claiming credit for that uh, when we export our palm kernel shells. Uh, and then there must be motivations and incentives to use palm-based products for decarbonization. Uh, I think that is something we can claim as well. Then. We are already doing it, yeah, but we're not claiming credit for it. Then. So we're doing a lot of exciting work in Mipo, and we like to help you as well and share your ideas. Uh, if you want any information, further information, please contact our director, Professor Chan Eng Kling. Uh, I'll stop my presentation here. Then. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Kwa. So very, very uh, intriguing numbers there, quite exciting numbers too. And, and perhaps when we come back to the discussion, uh, we can talk about, about how we, or what is needed in terms of policy to begin realizing uh, those numbers and perhaps what some of the barriers might be to, to getting that implemented. Uh, moving on to our next speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Hari Krishna Kulavira Singham. Uh, is the uh, was appointed Chief Research and Development Officer of Sam Dabi Plantation, Burhad, and this has been uh, since 2018. He began his career as a postdoctoral researcher with the University of California, Davis in 1990, joined Golden Hope Plantations uh, as a biotechnologist in 1991, uh, returned to academia uh, as a lecturer at University Putra, Malaysia in 1995, and remained there until 2003, uh, leaving as, as an associate professor. He then joined a Saim Darby Technology Center <coughs> in uh, 2003, uh, and later on uh, established a new technology center with uh, biotech uh, capability. Uh, he assumed the position as the director of, of research in 2005. Uh, finally, most recently, he joined uh, Simon W Plantations as a senior vice president, head of quantum leap research and development, R&D. Uh, has been doing that uh, since, uh, or at least until 2012. Uh, and then uh, as senior vice president for biotechnology and breeding up to 2015. And then uh, uh, taking charge of all research and development uh, up to the present time. So, uh, Dr. Hari Krishna also has a slide presentation. Uh, Dr. Hari, you can share your slides now. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. Uh, if you shared them, they should come up shortly. Yes, we see them now. Uh, if you could enter presentation mode. Yep. Wonderful. Right. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to share some of my thoughts with you. Um, I'm going to uh, approach this from a slightly different angle. Um, uh, approach it from actually looking at uh, improving productivity, um, you know, as a, as a means to actually increase value as well as reduce our carbon footprint. So, you know, um, if you look at the whole oil palm value chain, um, we believe that, you know, uh, if, if you can deploy innovation, that means to say deploy technology in the right way, we will be able to actually improve both productivity <clears throat> as well as um, reduce our both water footprint as well as carbon footprint. So if you, if you go from, uh, the advanced planting materials that can be developed if you deploy modern uh, genomics and, and uh, gene editing technology. Palms can be made to be uh, to use a lot less water 
and to also be a much more um, nutrient efficient, meaning to say you can apply less fertilizer and still get high yields, right? So in that manner, some of the emissions can be actually addressed in this manner and, and also reduce uh, wastages, right? Then if you start looking at um, the operations per se, um, if we de start deploying um, automated or mechanical harvesting machines, we can improve productivity on the ground, reduce wastages on the ground that we see at the moment because it's so heavily labor intensive. Um, an example would be, say, the use of drones for uh, pesticide spraying, where this can be actually deployed even in hilly areas um, and um, re require uh, uh, will result in uh, a lot more precise application as well as less uh, wastages, you know, and of course, a lot safer. Especially if we can then um, combine this with precision agricultural tools <clears throat> through advanced imaging, either by satellite or drones, the use of sensors, the use of IoT and digitization, then we are able to, uh, um, you know, I, I always think about it as you know, my customers are the palms. And for Saim Dhabi, we have 80 million palms. So are we actually addressing the needs of each of those individual palms? At the moment, they're treated as a, as a, as a group. But if we are able to actually def define the precise nutrient requirements for each individual palm and be able to apply it by using uh, GPS and also, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, machinery to to uh, to be able to apply at variable rates the fertilizers we are then able to actually reduce wastages and actually improve efficiency and in in that manner also reduce some of the emissions from this process mills have been talked a lot about um, you know maybe new processes need to be put in place to improve uh, productivity from mills improve extraction rates and so on and so forth um, and also refineries right the use of IoT devices, artificial intelligence, machine learning actually allows us to be much more efficient in terms of running these refineries, thus reducing wastages and most probably our carbon footprint. And in doing so, we will deliver a higher quality product to the customer that is hopefully fully, um, um, what do you call that, um, traceable. Sorry. <laughs> OK, now if we just look at the mill, I know the mill was covered earlier, but this is some of the value propositions that you can can obtain from the mill. Um, uh, Engineer Kwa talked about energy. Um, you know, uh, say, for example, if you look at empty fruit bunch or EFP, it's all accumulated in the mills and this offers a, a economic opportunity to actually add value to this product rather than just convert it into uh, fertilizer compost or whatever it is. And uh, one way in which uh, uh, you, could, you could actually valorize it is to actually convert it into this compound called nanocellulose, which has high value, right? Um, the other uh, element which is used as a, bio, uh, as a boiler fuel is pressed fiber, palm pressed fiber. So if we are able to extract the oil, it's a vitamin enriched oil that can actually be used as animal feed. And the de-oil fiber is, is high quality, can be used for paper packaging and so on and so forth. Biogas has been um, covered to a certain extent. You know, um, we, we, can, we can utilize it for electricity and in doing so, we can reduce our carbon footprint dramatically. Um, palm kernel cake, currently it's being used to feed ungulates or for uh, animals with four chambered stomachs. Um, but, you know, by certain hydrolytic uh, conversion, enzymatic conversion, it can be uh, made um, more efficient or effective as feed for uh, chickens and other, other animals that uh, are more prevalent in our part of the world. Right? Then uh, you have the so-called waste oil, right, uh, or lower quality oil that sometimes ends being ends up being blended into the, the 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 food oil, right? So this can be segregated and used for industrial purposes, and um, this also um, adds value to the industry. So, I think uh, if you look at immediate reduction of uh, carbon footprint, 
first thing that you need to deal with is the methane evolution from uh, the pomade ponds that has been mentioned earlier. It has the potential of reducing our carbon footprint by over 40 percent. Right. Green financing exists, but it requires enhancement. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved and, and funding is not automatic. So um, I think basically we need to look at uh, ways in which we improve the efficiency of this process. There's also valorization, as I said, from other biomass to add value and so you know you're talking about circularization of the uh, of the of the uh, economy or the oil palm uh, uh, economy so to speak then um, this unfortunately requires big investment because the the um, the factories to actually process this are all capex intensive and therefore there has to be some form of incentives provided to um, to help to uh, accelerate this process to adopt these kind of technologies. I think that's my two cents worth. I'm trying to keep within 10 minutes, so I hope I have. Thank you very much, Dr. Hari. Indeed you have. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, and, and by the way, we've had two presentations uh, already. So uh, as with the last session, uh, if, if uh, you'd like to uh, pose questions to any of the panelists, kindly put your questions in the chat or alternatively you could just raise your hand and uh, I, I'll be happy to to uh, give you the floor and time permits to to ask your questions directly to uh, this afternoon's panelists. Let me move to the third uh, speaker for this afternoon uh, and, and I will introduce him although he does not need any introduction. I'm Mr. Amar Chandran, Chairman of the IRGA Sindhiram Berhad an advisor to the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. Uh, with over 60 years of professional experience, uh, he's a veteran of the agro community um, and executive management uh, of business operations within the plantations, tree crops, commodity sector. He uh, served uh, for 35 years and, and actually retired as director and head of plantation uh, of Franco-Belgian uh, multinational uh, Sockfin. Uh, in 1996, he was the startup chief executive of the Malaysian Palm Oil Association (MPOA), and is uh, a graduate of the University of Adelaide in Agriculture, Economics and Technology. Uh, in addition, he has been um, honoured uh, with the fellowship awards uh, of the Incorporated Society of Planters, the the FISP, the Malaysian Oil Scientists and Technologists Association (FMOSTA), and the British Institute of Management (FBIM). And finally, of course, the Malaysian Institute of Management, FMM, and honorary mem uh, membership uh, in the RSPO. Uh, Mr. Amar Chandran, uh, can you share your slides now? The floor is yours. OK, thank you so much, uh, Gary, for that introduction. And thank you, Sunita, for your kind invitation to participate uh, in this round table. Um, as Gary mentioned, the theme is the optimizing resource use. Um, but what I'm going to focus on is the potential value proposition from, down, from downstream segments, as you see on the screen. And here I'm going to highlight eight key critical areas. And uh, I have given uh, extensive synopsis of my presentation, which I think is available on the CGM and CAN websites, you know, for you to follow up. So let's move to the first slide. Just to give you an overall picture, this is the total area under cultivation at the moment in Malaysia, 5.9 million hectares. Now, to put things in perspective, this is nearly 78% of the total cultivated agricultural land in Malaysia. In other words, just to point out how dominant the oil palm sector is in terms of agriculture mm -hmm. in the country. Now you can see the breakdown, 60% is basically the private sector and the balance nearly 40% is the smallholders, the government schemes, the FELDA, etc. Now what is interesting is there are 44 listed plantation companies in the Colin Post Stock Exchange. And uh, of that, public limited companies are about 25%, and private sector is the balance 36. Highly focused on private sector, and that explains the success of the industry in Malaysia. 
and contributes. I mean, this year, I think the contribution is going to be nearly 5% of the GDP. Um, the 3.5 is just an average, and you can see about one and a half million people are dependent on it. Now, we are at a critical stage. We are at the crossroads. There is no more land available in Malaysia for cultivation of oil palm, or for that matter, other tree crop. So we need to cap oil palm at about 6 million in my personal view. The ministry has said, the government has said six and a half million, but I think as has been mentioned earlier by Dr. Surina and others, uh, deforestation is no longer an option. Next slide. Okay, uh, I just want to focus on this. Why we, oh, why is it that we are failing when it comes to yield or productivity? Just have a look at 2015. Just look at the red line, the yield per hectare. We achieved a record 4.1 tons of oil per hectare in 2015. And look at the figure in 2020. We dropped all the way to 3.66. You know, I said this at a forum the other day. 3.66 was the average yield. The company that I worked for in Sockfin realized in 1960s. You know, so we haven't made the yield improvements or realized the potential yield possible. The good work done by the R&D boys and girls, but on the ground, we are lagging. So I have put a figure there, 6 million hectares planted, at a, you take the mature area at 5.4, it's normally between 11 to 12 percent immature. Now, can we achieve a yield of 4.5 tons? But the potential yield is, Dr. Harry will tell you, is six to seven tons of oil per hectare. But can we achieve 4.5? If we do, then we are looking at a production of 24 million tons or an additional 5 million tons from what we realized last year. Next slide. Now, this is the crux of the matter. Our competitors, look at the improvements, both soy, which is 50% increase over the last 25 years. And look at rapeseed in Europe, 45% increase. And look at where Malaysian palm is, a miserable 5% yield increase in the last 25 years. Now, let me move to the eight focus areas on downstream. Next slide. Okay, the value additive potential of downstream activities in a resource-based industry like the oil palm industry. We can no longer depend on palm oil as a commodity. We need to move, we need to increase our investments in value added downstream. We need to boost the value added processes through regulatory framework and fiscal incentives, which is lacking. Now we need to transform the primary commodities like CPO, palm kernel, and the byproducts into value added products. Yes, we have achieved great progress with all your chemicals and biodiesel to a certain extent, but we are lacking in specialty oils, chemicals, phytonutrients, and fast moving consumer goods. Second point, full integration across the entire support value chain. Because of the interconnectedness of the various segments of the value chain, it is important to have a 360 degree view of the entire downstream value chain. We cannot work in suboptimal silos. Full integration across the entire value chain is a necessity and everyone must play their part. Now, mitigation of market excess risks by effective management of the negative ESG impacts is largely dependent on upstream activities. But we need to realize that nearly 75% of our production are actually coming from integrated players in our country. So we need an integrated approach in this. Next slide. The upstream sector is a vital component of the supply chain. 
We need to ensure reliable supply of raw materials at competitive prices for developing value-added downstream sector. We, can no, we cannot go the way of rubber, timber, and cocoa industries in this country. We were the major producer. We were the number one producer of rubber, and we were also a major producer of timber and cocoa. But look at the state of affairs today. Today, we have shortages of domestic raw materials, and we are dependent on overseas feedstock for downstream activities. And the typical example I can give you is the glove industry in this country. Mm -hmm. The latex, we are not able to supply uh, sufficiently to the manufacturing plants. Hence, they have to import from our neighbors. Next slide. Improving sustainability, we do have, in spite of all the progress that has been made with breeding, still having 13% contamination. This is an official figure from MPOB of low yielding tenera materials being planted. Mm -hmm. And that results in a loss of more than a billion ringgit. So we need to introduce purity testing, and the technology has been developed by MPOB. And it's interesting that our own minister for plantation industries and commodities stated in his recent, just two months ago at the OFIC Congress, and this is what he said, and I quote, it is increasingly evident that unless DNA testing for seed quality is a regulatory requirement, Malaysia is unlikely to see a significant increase in palm oil yields. Bottom line is productivity. Move to point number five, the palm-based resource, renewable energy source, which has been covered by Engineer Kwa. But this is a fact. 43% of our energy mix in 2019 is from coal. And we all know coal is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. So the challenge to achieve net zero emission by 2050 has got to be addressed at this level, the energy level. And we need to also demonstrate, since we are the inventors of palm methyl ester, it was MPOB which uh, invented the palm methyl ester, and yet we are lagging behind Indonesia. So we need to make the effort to move at least to B30 by 2024 or even earlier. But what is more important and far more economic and sustainability driver is the hydro treated vegetable oils, which are second generation biofuels, which have a huge potential in contrast to methyl ester based fuels, because HVO is a drop in fuel because it can be used without any blending with the diesel. Next slide. Now, the value addition downstream. The concept of circular economy, reducing waste and creating value from waste. This is an environmentally friendly economic system, and it's based on the cradle to cradle as opposed to cradle to grave principles. Valorization, which has been touched on by Dr. Hari earlier, of palm oil mill byproducts, the extraction of natural products from agro. Waste is attractive, both social, environmental, and from an economic aspect. Number seven, absence of buy-in homegrown technologies. I have touched on this at many, many forums. A lot of discoveries have been made by not only by MPOB, but also by a lot of other private research institutes in this country. But commercialization, the applied research aspects we seem to be lacking. And the adoption of these uh, technologies is seem to be, a, there is a setback. And I think the reasons are the high uncertainty or the risk factors, the large fixed costs, and long lead times for project development or long payback periods. So this is where we need assistance from the government and the initiatives from the government. So the next slide. 
So the government has to sponsor and work with the industry in commercialization of high impact strategic projects, which have large investment costs. DNA testing of the seeds, as I said earlier, should be a regulatory requirement. And the serum standard for planting material should be revised. I mean, ironically, it is at 5%, whereas in Indonesia, I believe it is at 2% contamination. But here, we need to provide assistance to the smallholder sector. And this is the job of the government to plant only tested seedlings to ensure long term productivity. It is also important for the government to continue sponsoring basic and applied R&D because of the potential mm -hmm. high payoff. Now, the oil palm industry in Malaysia, unlike anywhere else, if you take any agriculture sector anywhere in the world, you will find that Malaysian palm oil industry, the oil palm industry, is the most taxed industry. We are the only industry in this country which has to pay a windfall profit level, which is applicable at this moment. And this year, my estimate is this contribution is going to be more than nearly close to one and a half billion ringgit in terms of just profit levy collection. Now, I, I mean, this has been said before, and part of this tax collection OK, justified, maybe, but should be channeled back for R&D and commercialization activities in oil. I just want to focus on these last two slides. Just to give you an idea, of what are the high end values that can be created from the palm oil product, palm oil and palm kernel oil? At the, we have the commodity oil can move into industrial chemicals, nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals, and pharmaceuticals. I just did some analysis of the last three days just to get some valuations on all this and came across some very good sources. So my last slide, I just show you what the current value of the products that can be manufactured and produced in this country with collaboration with high end technology people and what the potential values are. Just have a look at this table. Tocotrienols, yes, we are. Saim Dhabi is one of the producers of tocotrienols, so are a few other people out there. This is the current global value in 2018, 321 million, and the forecast is 522 million. I have given you the source at the bottom of the slides. You can make reference to it. Look at carotenoid, one and a half billion in 2019, potential 2 billion. Mm -hmm. Methyl ester sulfur, ester sulfonates, 2.6 billion, potential 3.6. Cosmetics and personal care products, 55 billion, potential is 70. Polyurethane and polyphenols. Polyphenols is so important. And the irony here is that this is phenolics. It is again, Extraction of phenolics from palm aqueous waste is an MPOB technology. But do you know who commercialized it? A Mexican plant in Mexico. They are the ones who have commercialized it just a few years ago. And look at the value of it. 1.3 billion in 2018, and the potential is more than 2 billion ringgit. Now, biomass, which has been touched on by both Dr. Hari and Engineer Kwa, the potential is huge. I mean, we need to realize that only 90%, I mean, sorry, only 10% of the palm tree is today being capped and created value. The 90% remains untapped. And the potential are biofertilizers, renewable energy, biocomposites, bio based chemicals, et cetera. There is no value to it, and there's a, it could be mind-boggling if you want to put a value to all that, you know? So with that, my final conclusion is this. You know, it is frustrating that the industry is risk-averse and prefers immediate short-term benefits, and in the process, denies itself of great gains. It is a great disservice to the industry. That's my concluding remark. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Gary. 
Thank you, Emma Chandran, for a very comprehensive review of uh, the uh, downstream potential in particular uh, of the palm industry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, each of the three panelists this afternoon have actually uh, contributed uh, written material, which is available on blog posts. If you go and check with uh, Climate Governance Malaysia, CAN, as well as CAN websites, I believe you can find these blog posts there. They are quite uh, uh, detailed in terms of, of what has been presented today and go beyond certainly what has been presented in the slides. So, uh, and, and by the way, up to now, they've already had, since they've been posted just a few days ago, uh, more than 190 views. Right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, in fact, we have something like 27 minutes before, before the end of this session. So um, thank you all for your questions that you've posed so far. We will try to get to as many as we can. Uh, but uh, to, to begin with, I think we'd like to focus on, on some of the questions that, that uh, call for a justification. And some of these questions refer to uh, some of the negative uh, impacts uh, that palm plantations have. Of course, the deforestation is one that has cropped up often. Uh, expansion into peat is another one. Uh, some of the areas uh, of concern include the fact that combustion of uh, palm methyl ester uh, may yield uh, uh, combustion products that, that perhaps are more hazardous than those coming from fossil diesel, although I'm not sure how far we can substantiate it. But it's, it's my understanding that, that when we talk about ramping up uh, production, aside from, from, from uh, more efficient use of the entire resource space, uh, more effectively and more efficiently producing the resource space, uh, Aren't we talking actually about in improving the intensity of production? In other words, improving the yield per unit hectare, particularly from areas that are currently under yielding. Okay, for example, uh, one of the problems raised has been nitrous oxide, which is of course uh, uh, com comes from fertilizer in, in the field, volatilization. Uh, and uh, so how do we, we uh, and as you saw also from the previous previous uh, session, we talked about smallholders and, and uh, and what can be done there, that they have the highest potential. How do we improve production efficiency in Malaysia while ensuring that, that uh, the inputs do not inadvertently become part of the problem? For example, the fertilizer going to nitrous oxide, uh, excess use of, of uh, uh, irrigation uh, energy, for example. Uh, and and uh, how, how can, can government uh, facilitate this process with uh, uh, very clear policy directives. Can we start with the uh, engineer Kwa and then after that, uh, Dr. Hari and, and the Mr. Chandran. That was a very long question. Uh, it's <laughs> it's actually you. in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you give a brief summary of that? What was required? So, so, so basically, how can we justify increasing uh, production intensity or increasing yield uh, when, when we've got uh, issues of deforestation. For example, I, I already said, you know, if, if not, if we're improving uh, yield, then we don't don't have to add additional land base, and we don't have to to uh, deforest additionally. Or if you know, so uh, that that's sort of the question. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think where I would like to approach it from is basically the the the, the climate and the and the infrastructure, and the scenario, and the policy that moves us in that direction of improving yields and so on. And there needs to be a very, very uh, big and important push. And that is why I'm a very strong supporter of us going to net uh, zero carbon. Because once that is in place, uh, and, and it takes a lot of effort, no? as I said in my paper, a lot of effort to do that, structural changes, policy changes and so on, and very high political will as well in this very difficult times. So, so once you have that in place, certain things will come in by the very nature of you or us wanting to be net carbon zero. Yeah. So I think that one, the net carbon zero has to be an act and not an aspiration. Uh, there are, I think, 139 countries at this stage, I think, who have aspirations, but not all of them are acts. Uh, and uh, you can, if you look at the policy, there can be flaws in it and so on. Now, once you have the act in place, several things will start to fall in place then, yeah? And one of them is, uh, 
I think one of them that will come in very strongly would be carbon pricing. We have awarded carbon pricing for a very long time. We had this uh, CDM and that fell through after a while. And if, carbon, if the carbon uh, pricing policy is in place, uh, then what you're going to find is a lot of uh, things that I was talking about. Yeah, getting a higher uh, usage of biodiesel, uh, uh, getting uh, what you call it, uh, factories and mills and power stations to use biomass. The drive for that will be greater because the price you have to pay for using fossil fuels will move it in that direction. So I think that that is something that is very important as, as a motivation and as a push for that to happen. Now, everybody knows those things are there, but nobody wants to do it. And as uh, I think I read the, 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 the chat group, uh, uh, our expert, uh, uh, Mr. Krishnamurti has said, yeah, it's not so easy. The efficiency of biomass is not so good, but there are always technologies you can develop to help improve it and so on, provided there is the motivation. So that's one part of it. Uh, the other one is on deforestation. Um, I, I think the presentation from uh, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chandran has been very good eh, to put everything into perspective about the amount of land we should uh, cap for palm oil. Now, I think in March, the Prime Minister launched a, I think, forest, forest uh, policy, eh? yeah, just in March. Yeah, and he says, we will maintain it at 50% of forests. Now, one of the things I didn't see in that, maybe I have missed it, is 50% when? Because 50% in 2050 and 50% in 2100 are quite different things. So if you have a million ringgit and you can spend it all by tomorrow, you feel you're a rich man. But you have to spend it in 100 years, spread out over 100 years, you don't actually have a lot. And when I started with my slide, I showed the green part, our forest cover. That is a very important reserve for us to mitigate any uh, or, or to help us in our journey towards net, to net, uh, uh, net, net zero carbon. Because once you use that up, and I think I learned it from you, uh, Dr. Gary, it takes 100 years to grow back the forest. Yeah, Even if you plant a new one, it doesn't help it. So I think that resource we have of the 50, I think at the moment it's just under 56% of forest cover. It's very, very precious to us. And that's something we have to keep in mind. And this increase in yields and so on that uh, uh, both uh, my, my colleagues here, panelists have mentioned is something very, very important. Yeah, mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Kwa. Uh, Dr. Hari, could you address this from a standpoint of uh, yield, increasing yield in areas where yield can be increased? And what are some of the, the needs, as it were, uh, to make sure that this happens without uh, some of the unintended consequences on the side? Yeah, I, I, I firmly believe that yields can be increased without having, a con 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 having the same uh, increase in inputs, right? And uh, it, it needs to be driven by research, right? Um, the research intensity has to be there and uh, is driven by innovation, right? Innovation is, is essentially using people who are entrepreneurial in thinking with data that they have and they see opportunities, right? To deploy that data in a positive manner, which, uh, you know, uh, gives them a, maybe a business opportunity as well as uh, outcome in terms of reducing the carbon footprint and so on and so forth, right? So I would say the first thing is that, uh, as Mr. Chandran mentioned, the government is going to tax us, the, the, the whole industry, over over billion ringgit, right? In terms of just windfall, let, let alone all the other taxes, right? Um, if that's the case, you know, um, I would say a significant proportion of that needs to be put back to fund research. Research basically in the public universities and as well as MPOB, right? And and democratize it and give people opportunity to work in these novel areas, right? The, the other gap is when you, um, especially when it comes to mills, right? Uh, is the fact that when you're going from lab scale to pilot or to industrial scale, it's very expensive because you require to build very large uh, steel structures and so on and so forth. So uh, again, you know, if there are funds that help to bridge that that uh, gap so that 
proof of the pudding in terms of the outcome of these technologies can be can be actually uh, uh, provided that industry actually will invest in it right so at the moment it's uh, issue of chicken and egg situation right then um, for biogas for example um, for 60 ton mills and and larger uh, it's actually economically viable provided you have the infrastructure close by and you can actually connect it up to the grid and deliver so-called green energy to the grid, right? Um, however, if you are stuck in some out, out, outlying uh, place where the grid is no long, nowhere close to you, the cost of actually bringing the grid to you is just prohibitive and it's not economic, right? So there are two ways of going about it. If we really want as a national level to, to utilize this resource, um, um, for reducing our car carbon footprint and increasing the amount of renewable energy that we, we utilize is to actually incentivize maybe Tanaga to bring the, the power lines closer to those mills or to actually uh, incentivize gas Malaysia, whatever, to uh, bottle those uh, the, the biogas and compress it and transport it to areas where it can be um, utilized, right? And we then can then, uh, instead of flaring the, the methane, right, uh, which also can be done, I mean, this would be a, a way in which you actually maximize potential of that, of these mills which are, which are uh, outlying, right? Um, then um, I think in terms of the industry members, most of the industry members essentially have programs to improve their yield and productivity because it, it's our business, right? The issue is with smallholders. So, uh, and, and as Mr. Chandran mentioned earlier, their, their, their materials as well as their, their uh, agricultural, um, let's say, um, uh, methodology that they use, perhaps may not, may not be commensurate to actually delivering the highest performance, right? So, uh, whether support can be given to, to help them to replant, but with good materials, and also an educational program to actually provide them the means to actually know how to actually uh, manage their, their land holdings in a more sustainable and efficient manner. So I, I hope that sort of covers it. Yeah, it seems like you've caught everything. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Chandran could could uh, add, add on to anything that perhaps, perhaps you might have left off. Uh, perhaps, well, um, Mr. Chandran, uh, also from from, I mean, he, uh, Dr. Hari has has, has uh, alluded to some of of uh, the solutions, uh, but thus far, in, in relation to the last slide that you presented, the, the policy frameworks that could help bring these about, perhaps could you to carry this further from from where Dr. Hari left off? Yeah, um, if you're looking at value, I mean, let me just touch on productivity. You know, the, the gap, as I said earlier, is about 40 to 50 percent between the potential, commercial potential, not uh, research, not the pilot trials, commercial, six tons of oil per hectare. And look at, we are well below four tons of oil per hectare. So there is a huge gap. Now, in the Malaysian context, there are two things which I have spoken about. One is our labor which we don't, we, we have not touched on that subject in this uh, round table. Our critical labor shortage and dependence on foreign workers, and with all this uh, knee-jerk policies that come out of the government with the respect to foreign labor, that is not going to help the industry. We don't have a long-term policy on foreign workers. And we are in an industry which is at a 25 year cycle. So we need a long term policy. And it has been calculated. Uh, the Malaysian Estate Owners Association and MPOA, for example, have put a figure of saying that we are losing something between 15 to 20 percent of our annual production possibility due to labor shortage. So <clears throat> that government has got to address. There, there is no running away from it. Yes. Mechanization, a lot of precision agricultural technologies are in place, but at the end of the day, the harvesting of the bunch, you still need a man under the tree. You know, 
whether you can give him the most sophisticated of equipments to cut and increase his productivity, but you still uh, need a human being. You know, we haven't reached the stage of employing a robot to do the harvestings yet. That's a long way off. Now, the other factor I think we need to bear in mind your question about adding the potential value creations. We cannot do it on our own because we have a very limited domestic market. And you can see the trends today. Some of the big consumer goods manufacturers in the world, they're looking at our neighbor, mm -hmm. Indonesia. Basically because three factors. One is domestic market. Two is availability of workforce at all levels. You know, they have highly skilled workers for the thing. And the third factor is raw materials. I mean, if you are a Unilever, for example, and you are using, I mean, you've got 440 brands under Unilever. And look at the number of ingredients, as Poovan referred to earlier, you know, mm. uh, the number of ingredients. And Indonesia produces a lot of these agricultural commodities. So the availability of these commodities are there. The labor force is there, and you have a ready-made domestic market of 260, 270 million. Now, we do not have that. So how do we capitalize on it? We need to have a consortium at the local level. It cannot be done by one company. It cannot be done just by the Saimdabis or the KLKs or the IOIs, you know. It's got to be a consortium effort in partnership and collaboration with the technology providers and where the market is. So if you're looking at the cosmetics industry, for example, yes, we have the basic ingredients for this. We can be extracted, but we need the brands to work with us. So there has got to be a mechanism or an avenue in order to have all this under one roof and take it from there to create the value. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, bringing this this back to to um, uh, achieving uh, net net zero emissions by by 2050, certainly uh, if we see the plantation industry as part of the solution rather than part of the problem, right? you know, see see it as as one of the key enablers to achieve a net zero by 2050. Um, Surely, I, uh, surely we, we have pathways for the entire resource base that we have in mind. Uh, we, we know that that uh, for the non-oil uh, products, uh, there's definitely going to be growth, as Mr. Mr. Chandran's slide uh, clearly shows. All right, but uh, uh, what about those areas that that could perhaps more directly uh, help us in the transition? Uh, to to uh, a low emission uh, pathway. Uh, for example, we, we, we talk about about uh, the perhaps sin of of thinking that everything that can be combusted should be combusted because it's all renewable. But the fact uh, remains that that much of the fiber actually goes into very high quality materials, pulp and paper, medium density fiberboard, packing, etc. And that all of these industries actually have their own waste stream, which is sort of the waste from the waste and the waste from the waste from the waste. And ultimately, there is some measure of, of waste that uh, can be pellet pelletized, it can be carbonized, you know. So, so what are some of the the uh, areas, promising areas that, that we could, could go into? We don't have a lot of time left, about 10 minutes. And perhaps if you could uh, uh, merge some of these thoughts together with, with your closing thoughts uh, on these issues uh, and then tie it perhaps to to what uh, kind of uh, regulatory environment the government needs to put in place to help bring this about. Uh, it, it's a bit much to ask, <laughs> but uh, if, if we could begin that that process. Uh, uh, Engineer Kwa, would you would you be willing to start with this? Yeah, I, I can start with that. I, I think al although I have uh, concentrated on energy because that was the focus of our paper, it's a very, very, very clearly we are aware that that's not the only path to go. Yeah? And there are a lot of other uses you can have for that. 
and uh, so that you can uh, use it in other ways. And this, this other ways and so on could be a lot more, um, what do you call that, uh, profitable than the one I've suggested because the, the paralysis process is something that requires a lot of capital and a lot of, uh, what do you call that, uh, yeah, the operational cost will be very high and so on. But what needs to move into that, I think there, there are two things, uh, there, there's one thing that we need to address and whether it should be industry, right? Some entrepreneur comes along and says, yes, I have a great idea. I want to take it on. Uh, hopefully we find that happening. But as Chandran uh, has put, I think that was your very slide, very last slide. Uh, our industry is very risk averse. We, we don't want to be the first. Yeah, it's OK to be the second, provided somebody has paved the way. So that's one part of the of, of the of, of the scenario then. And so I think in order to enable that, I think there must be some uh, incentive given by the government. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure that uh, we've got to put this in place and how the net zero will help to promote this, because uh, I think if you start to use um, the, the, the fiber material, if you don't need to use it for energy, but you use it for fiber and paper and so on, I think the value of that uh, in in, the, in, in uh, reducing the, the carbon footprint, yeah, the net zero is probably even higher than, yeah, because it hasn't really gone into the uh, the atmosphere in that sense, eh? yeah. Because one of the things I've always been grappling with, and eh? yeah, it's still carbon dioxide when you burn it, except you say it's renewable because it can be taken back by the trees and and put back in the ground as compared to fossil fuel. But in that sense, it's still carbon dioxide as well. So I think. I think there needs to be a, a couple of things going on then, as to balance that then. And I think the government push and hopefully in my mind, the net zero carbon uh, direction that we're going will help to encourage that. Then. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and that also brings to mind the fact that, that if you're producing fiber, we're also uh, increasing the fiber from non-forest and non non uh, wood products, which actually uh, reverses the indirect land use change. Uh, before you begin, Dr. Hari, could I ask you to also address, we've had some questions on um, uh, biodiesel and, and, and uh, HVOs, uh, and uh, and what what perhaps what, what are some of the, being the technologist, what are some of the benefits of moving to HVOs uh, compared to, to directly using methyl ester? And can that also be tied to the, the food versus fuel debate uh, in the sense that, that there's increasing interest in using used cooking oil, for example, uh, and the, the inedible uh, oil, perhaps from overripe fruit or foods that have oxidized too much, kept too long. Would you would you work that into your closing remarks? Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I, I think there is. Uh, we're talking, we, um, we're talking about uh, wellness. Uh, producing wellness and healthy products, right? So palm oil is a is a healthy product, right? And um, therefore, uh, if if we are able to segregate out, let's say the high FFA or the the lower quality type oils from our mills, um, the, whether they're you know uh, there's a flood and and then they process the crop that has been sitting around for some time or whatever it is, all all of that material actually is suitable for industrial use. But not for food use, right? And in doing so, and especially if um, the authorities are able to validate that, you know, we are not taking, say, food grade uh, materials for industrial use, which is one of the issues that is raised, right? Um, you know, whether food for fuel or whatever it is, right? Um, if if it can, if if there are uh, systems put in place whereby uh, this can be validated in a transparent manner that actually, yes, this this oil is, is not fit for human consumption and therefore can go down the route of uh, industrial use. And industrial use doesn't mean just using it for for conversion to diesel. It could also be used for for making cosmetics or any of these other products if you, if you want to, right? Because it's carbon chains, you can modify it in whichever way is uh, possible. But I think the the difference between the, the methyl ester route and the other route is, is essentially based on the investment that you have in place, right? Um, currently, there are many methyl ester plants. 
the the uh, was it a VPO? Is it VPO or um, the um, the other route, right? HVO. Sorry, HVO. <laughs> yeah, HVO route essentially utilizes the the um, fossil fuel type platforms, right? Um, um, so it depends on on who who, who is actually uh, involved in this process, right? Uh, to to produce those kind of fuels, of course, the 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 capex cost for those kind of plants is much higher than the capex cost for a uh, biodiesel plant, right? So this is the, this is some of the differences as far as I understand it, right? Um, I think that was the 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 question, right? If I addressed uh, yeah, uh, there's a little bit something about uh, the UCO, the used cooking oil. If... Ah, yeah, okay, yes. So that this is where innovation comes in, right? So now it uh, allows the opportunity for um, entrepreneurs to get involved and, and set up businesses to collect, let's say, use cooking oil from various parties, right? Which otherwise might be going back into our food chain, right? You know, and this can be segregated out and, and um, it's actually uh, properly uh, quantified because they come from, uh, from uh, food factories and so on and so forth. So there's a there's a a, a a trail that you can follow in terms of mass balance and so on and so forth, and then uh, convert that into uh, biofuel, diesel, that you get a advantage in Europe because you're actually converting this uh, used uh, material, right? Yeah. So I think I think basically it is uh, allowing people the opportunity to do so, but. I think what will help is if the government were uh, were able to actually provide, let's say, some form of platform in which the numbers can be validated. Okay, so a, a tracking mechanism of sorts, yeah. of some kind of regulatory framework for tracking. Yes, Mr. Chandran, uh, we're, we're going to uh, uh, close the, the, the program with your your final words here. So, um, apart from some of the questions that have been raised, and and you feel free to to address anyone. Uh, your your questions and then and then the closing remarks. Yeah, um, you know, I think we have a great opportunity to avoid incurring any carbon debts. Mm. I think one aspect. I mean, there has been some studies done in terms of the potential of the carbon sequestration of an oil palm plantation, but I don't think we really have a thorough study out there for different geographical areas and uh, different soil types and different mm -hmm. climate range, et cetera. And this is something which we need to undertake. And this is, I think, is the role of MPOB uh, in perhaps in collaboration with the universities to undertake this, to do a completely a detailed study on the potential of the mm -hmm. carbon sequestration. That in itself is a good story. Now. We have, I think, under RSPO, as uh, Dr. Surina mentioned earlier, all the companies have signed on to literally to NDPE. No deforestation, no peat. That's another. And of course, no exploitation. So if you're looking at it from that point of view, avoidance on the one thing and uh, uh, factor in the carbon sequestration potential of the oil palm plantations, you know, nearly 6 million hectares that we have. I think we should be able to come up with some formulas and calculations to see. And I wouldn't be surprised. And if we can do the methane capture from the palm oil mill waste, et cetera, we can easily achieve net zero for the whole complex of the plantation industry that is upstream as well as the uh, processing at the mill level. And of course, when you go down further down, it is possible like refining oleochemicals and all that. You know, these are all slightly high end uh, processing technologies which uh, I'm sure engineer Kwa can explain, you know, uh, mitigation of carbon there is very, very possible. So if you look at the whole industry from a plantation right down to the oleochemical or a speciality fat that you end produce, which is for the consumer goods manufacturers or an ingredient to use, we can achieve the net zero. It's possible, but we do need 
thorough peer-reviewed studies and get them published in international journals. That is the, and, and I think we are not really doing that, I am afraid. You know, I mean, uh, I, I don't understand, you know, because MPOB managed to do two back-to-back -back articles in Nature when it came to the uh, sequencing of the oil palm genome. That was a tremendous achievement, you know, um, but that was a few years back. But there is a whole lot of other studies that can be done, you know, but we are not, you know, uh, pushing for it. I don't know why the industry is not pushing. After all, industry is funding the research, you know, asking these sort of questions. Perhaps Dr. Hari should be pushing this through Sam David. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's my concluding remark. I, I, I think, you know, I always say we have a wonderful story to tell, Dr. Gary, but we don't know how to tell the story. Gary, you're silent. Oops, my apologies. I, I, I have a little piece of paper in front of me that says, remember to unmute. <laughs> and I don't always see the piece of paper. But um, essentially, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the tracking and the, and the publication always seems to stop at how much we export. OK, so we exported <laughs> uh, uh, so many tons of, of, um, uh, of palm methyl ester to Europe. <laughs> but it just stops right there. It doesn't say that that you know, uh, in converting that many tons of palm methyl ester to biodiesel, yeah. re Europeans uh, avoided emitting three million tons of, right. of carbon dioxide equivalent right. per year. So, yeah, so exactly. many times the information, exactly. yes, is out there. So, before before I, uh, I know we're going a bit over time, but I'd like to to do one last thing before we end, uh, before I say thanks to the speakers, and that's to run the poll again. We. We, for those of you who, who weren't with us in the last session, we actually had a poll, uh, and I'd ask for, the, for, the, for that poll to be run again for those who weren't at the last session. Uh, I'd ask those who, who did uh, uh, participate in the last session, maybe you want to sit out this time. It's okay. We try not to, to uh, skew the numbers here. But uh, um, if you would now look at this poll in front of you on the screen, can Malaysia reach net zero by 2050? The three choices are yes, Malaysia can la or maybe or no. So uh, give us another uh, five to seven seconds for us to make our choices. I've already participated last time around. It ref the, the box refused to leave my screen until I put something in and hit submit. So the way to, to get this box out of your screen is to, to make a choice and hit submit. And uh, another three seconds or so, two and one, and perhaps we can now have the uh, secretariat uh, put up the results of the poll. You know, maybe maybe I do have to make a choice. Uh, maybe I have to vote again to get rid of this box. <laughs> ah, yes. And so, uh, yeah, the results now are quite a bit different, perhaps. <laughs> I see Engineer Kwa's elation at the change uh, in the numbers. So uh, from uh, the previous poll where we had a, a, a serious front runner in maybe at 50%, was it? And then the other two at 25% each. We now have 50%. Yes, Malaysia can la, and maybe uh, only at uh, 43%, and no down to 7%. So I'm, I would venture a guess that the uh, uh, sizable uh, resource base provided by by the Palm Ministry has given some of our views, viewers uh, some uh, grounds on which to increase uh, their aspirations or, or the expectations of, of what might happen. So. A big thank you to all our guests from the first session uh, th earlier this afternoon, uh, Mr. Poovan, uh, Salvanathan, Dr. Serena Ismail, and Mr. Olive Olivier Tishi. And also from this section, a big, big thank you to Engineer Kwa Kiat Singh, uh, Dr. Hari Krishna Kulavira Singham, and uh, of course, Mr. Chanjan. Uh, thank you so very much for being with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for spending your afternoon with us. Don't forget, there is another session. Uh, for the plantation sector on the 12th, I believe, of, of this month. Uh, do tune in. Uh, that will be uh, on biodiversity, I believe, and, and the deforestation. So uh, once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, Climate Action 
uh, sorry, CEO Action Network, Ken, as well as Climate Governance Malaysia, CGM, do have a very good evening and back to the Secretariat. Ken. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been a great two sessions. We really appreciate this. And uh, so we will try and get responses to all of the answers, uh, to all of the questions that were raised. Yeah. And uh, the recording will be available as soon as possible. Thank you so much, everyone. Much appreciated. Thank you, Sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.